and welcome to day four of Online Camp. We've had an absolute cracking week so far. I really hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, we've got loads planned for today, so I won't talk too much. Uh, but we really hope you enjoy what we have in store for day four and day five. Yeah, so this evening we are hearing from James and from James, along with all of the other bits that we have in our HNDCYC Discovery celebration. But first, I'm going to pray. Lord God, I thank you for this week. I thank you for the way that you move, not only when we meet together, but when we are on our own and praying and spending time with you on our own, Lord. And I just thank you for that. I thank you for the technology that allows us to share all that we have in store for discovery each year, but changing things up and having it online. And I just thank you for that opportunity, Lord. And I just pray that you will meet with each and every one of the campers who are joining with us for Discovery Online. Amen. Amen. Water park. The water park. Water park. Splashdown. Washing up. Fun and banter in the laughter. Laughter. Banter. Ping pong pong. In the pool. Theme night. Theme night. Bonfire. The showers being on site. Seeing all of your lovely faces again. Praising God together. Worship. Fellowship. Hanging out with all you guys. Friends. Being back together. Seeing everyone in the flesh. Everything. 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 The smell of canvas.
see the scars you roll out the beauty of your face through tears of joy I'll leave my voice Tonight's going to be slightly different. We've got uh, two different places where the good news of Jesus is going to go, and we've got two different characters that we're going to dig deep into. So for that reason, we're going to have two different Jameses who are going to speak this evening. I'm going to do half of the talk as we look at one character, and James Ryan's going to do the other half. James is uh, a great young lad who's based in London, who's just come back from a ski mission year, and uh, James has been leading us in our worship all week. I'm really excited to hear what he's got for us. So now enough from this James, and over to the other James. Cheers James, hi everyone, I am James, and I hope you've been enjoying Camp Online so far this week. I certainly have, it's been really great. And yeah, it's not the same as real camp, is it? It's not the same as being in a field, getting wet, um, and getting your arms sunburnt. Um, but we're looking forward to next year for 2021 and all that God has in store. And uh, yeah, we're enjoying the time now in, uh, in COVID, in these strange times. And in the meantime, uh, we're going to look uh, through, continue our journey through Acts, and we're going to be in Acts chapter 8. Yesterday we heard from Beth uh, a pattern that carries on here, where we are today, which is that persecution leads to preaching, which leads to paradise. And the contextual example of that is that at the end of Acts chapter 7, Stephen is killed. He's the first Christian to be martyred, to be killed for the faith. That is the worst form of persecution. Um, and then the disciples and the church is scattered throughout the land, um, fearing the persecution and uh, running from it. But where they go, they preach. Wherever they're scattered, they preach. So the persecution led to preaching. And those who heard the word and saw the signs believed and were saved 
and were brought into paradise. So preaching, persecution, paradise. And a great example of this is Philip, a man called Philip, uh, who was a disciple of Christ, a godly man, and a friend of Stephen. So he knew all about it. He was right there. So Acts chapter 8, verse 4 to 8 reads this. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the, gospel, the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who, who were paralysed or lame, couldn't walk, were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Firstly, it's incredible that Philip's willing to continue to preach and potentially suffer and risk his life for the gospel of Jesus, for the good news, after what happened to Stephen. And secondly, just quickly, the effect of the persecution, um, as we've heard, is the opposite of what the persecutors wanted. They wanted to crush the church, but instead the church grew, it spread. Romans 8, 28, God reminds us that he works all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That's us, that's us as believers. But here's what's significant in this passage. The Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. They were enemies, they were rivals, they never associated. So for Philip to go to Samaria and to speak to the Samaritans was completely not heard of, not done, no, no one did that. Um, think classic rivalries, Liverpool Man U, uh, Coke versus Pepsi, Marvel versus DC, and for me it would be Hamilton versus Rosberg in the Formula One World Championship. And in the three years that they were teammates, especially towards the end, you wouldn't see them talking to each other, unless they had to. You wouldn't see a Jew talking to a Samaritan, unless he or, she, he or she had to. But Philip didn't care, he just, he just went. He went to Samaria um, and preached the word wherever he went. And remember what James was telling us on Monday, that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So secondly, this is the, um, the first time the gospel goes outside of Jerusalem, it goes to Samaria, um, as Jesus said it would. And uh, what a place to go to, uh, the, the enemy camp, the rivalry, the, the town that, that no one went to. And there he is speaking, speaking Jesus to them. But he's not done yet. If we go uh, to verse 26 to 29, in chapter 8, uh, it reads this. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. So the spirit, the Lord, has sent... Uh, Philip into the desert, literally in the middle of nowhere, he bumps into a random guy who um, happens to be important, he happens to be reading the Bible, uh, and he's just been to Jerusalem. It turns out he's actually reading a passage in Isaiah which is about Jesus, it's a prophecy about Jesus. And he's seeking to know more, he's questioning it, he's wondering what it means for him. So Philip tells him, He's there, the right place, the right time, and he just tells him about Jesus, tells him what he knows, tells him what he knows about the passage and the person of Jesus. And then they're on their way and they, they come across a pool of water in the middle of the desert, and instead of saying, let's have a drink, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch says, what can stand in the way of me being baptized, me giving my life to Christ? So Philip baptizing him and the eunuch goes away, it says rejoicing, utterly changed, completely saved, and uh, all because Philip was there and he just chatted Jesus to him. And then it continues. Philip is taken away, he's like transported to another town called Azotus, and he just keeps preaching, keeps just telling people about Jesus. And it's almost comical, it's funny that he just, wherever he goes, that's what he's just talking about, just telling people, his friends, those he doesn't know, he's just uh, doing it naturally, it's natural to him. He just chats Jesus wherever he goes. So what does that look like for us? Well. We saw with Philip that he just went all over the place and opportunities basically just came in him. They just came to him. They basically just fell in his lap. And this could happen to us too. We can share Jesus wherever we go. We can preach. And um, preaching can look like many things. It can look like standing on a stage in a church building, 
um, preaching. Uh, it can look like telling your friends what you learned at camp, telling strangers about Jesus, um, about what you know, just like Philip. It can, be, it can look like offering prayer for people, um, maybe for healing, maybe for comfort, um, and maybe just for thanks, rejoicing with them um, and thanking God for them. It's important not to feel guilty, to beat ourselves up, um, to put pressure on it, um, but just for it to be natural, just to ask God for opportunities and wait for him to bring you them, um, because he will, and people are often seeking. I know for me that the times when I've thought, I need to evangelize, I need to, I need to, um, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't led to anything. It's just led to me, like, like I said, feeling guilty, feeling pressured, feeling uh, not worthy or, or something. Um, but the times when I've just been going about my daily business and God's brought opportunities to me are the ones that are fruitful. I think of a time when I was on the way to work, on the way to Pizza Hut, and I was just doing deliveries on the motorbike and I was just walking up the street with my helmet and uh, walked past a, a guy sat by a tree uh, begging. And I was kind of already nearly late for work, so I was just, you know, just trying to walk past and I started making excuses to God, like, oh, I'm late for work and I've just got my helmet and, you know, uh, but I felt like the Spirit saying you should speak to him. So I kind of walked past and then turned around and went back to speak to him. And he turned out to be um, looking for uh, basically help to help for his family. And um, he was kind of troubled and upset about them. And he turned out to be Spanish. So and he didn't speak much English. So there I am trying to work out what he's saying with my like AS level Spanish and um, trying to translate a rough prayer to him. So I prayed for him. Um, in sort of like half Spanish, half English, and just was able to somehow, through the Spirit, I guess, encourage him uh, that God had a plan for him and his family, and that it was going to be all right. And yeah, it's just an example of uh, when I didn't uh, put pressure on it, I just let God bring me an opportunity, and um, I was obedient. So that's it from me, and I'm going to send it over to James. Cheers, guys. Thanks, James. And now back to me, James. We've heard all about Philip and uh, the way that he chatted Jesus wherever he went. But now let's look at a different character. Let's look at the guy who's called No Name, but the Ethiopian eunuch. Perhaps you don't know what a eunuch is. If you're younger than 14, maybe go and ask your mum and dad. Uh, but for everybody else, a eunuch is, uh, is a practice we don't usually do today, but it's when someone is a servant or a slave in the ancient world. One of the things that people would do is to make them more loyal is that they would remove their reproductive organs, their testicle, if you will, their meat and two veg. And what that would do is because you weren't there to kind of start your own family, uh, you'd be more loyal to the regime. Now here's a guy who is a eunuch. Uh, it says at the start of the story, Philip starts out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen, of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. I guess there's a tension at the center of this guy's life. He's an important official, but he'll always be someone without a name. He's someone who will always be surrounded by people giving orders, but feeling completely alone. Loved and yet not known at all. He feels like an outsider, like a nobody, despite his senior role. I wonder if you've ever felt a bit like this. Well, there's a kind of contradiction at the heart of your life that you're kind of, I don't know, surrounded by people, but never been more lonely. Lady Gaga, in her documentary, Gaga Five Foot Two, uh, talks about this feeling of being so adored by fans, but actually being deeply alone. She says this to her production manager, I'm alone, Brandon, every night, and all these people will leave, she says seemingly crying on the phone to an unknown friend in one post. They will leave and then I'll be alone. And I go from everyone touching me all day and talking at me all day to total silence. Maybe a bit like the eunuch, maybe a bit like Lady Gaga, you're thinking, is there more to life than this? Surely it's not just about being unimportant and alone. Well, here's a guy, the Ethiopian eunuch, who's been looking into religion. He's been looking into Christianity and he's gone to visit Jerusalem. And on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot, reading a book of the Bible, a book called Isaiah the Prophet. And Jerusalem 
in one sense, must have been amazing to see the centre of the Christian religion, to see the temple, to see all sorts of stuff going on. And at the same time, because he was a eunuch and because he was Ethiopian, because he was foreign, he wouldn't have been allowed in the temple. He would have got this sense that he is an outsider. His trip to Jerusalem must have been a little bit disappointing when all of a sudden he's in his chariot and there's Philip. This little guy running next to the chariot who's asking, do you understand what you're reading? Now, he doesn't realise, but the eunuch is reading something really key. How can I explain it, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who's the prophet talking about, himself or somebody else? The eunuch's actually reading a really important part of the Bible called the Servant Songs in Isaiah. And the servant, whoever he is, will suffer. There's all this poetry written about this servant who's to come. And he's going to suffer and he's going to die. It says to take away the sins of lots of different people. It's such an important prophecy. There's that line, isn't it? Who can talk about the servant's descendants? And you're thinking, that's like me. I'm a servant and I'm not going to have any descendants because of my uh, problems. And he asked Philip, look, is the guy talking about himself or could he be talking about someone else? Could he be talking about me? And Philip says, you know what? He's talking all about someone a lot like you and yet very different from you. He's talking all about Jesus. And then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. See, here's a servant with no descendants because Jesus came to die for people like you and I. He came to serve and love people who were different from him. He loved us and he died to take away all our sins. A bit of the servant song says, uh, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, turned away from God. But God lays on Jesus, the sin of us all. Here's someone in Jesus that can offer forgiveness. Here's someone who can offer significance. And the reality is that this is everything that this Ethiopian man was looking for. This is what he'd gone to Jerusalem to look for, and it's just here. So it's small wonder that at the end of the story, he gets baptised. Now, in one sense, we don't know what happens to the story at the end. Do you remember how the story ends for this man? When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. But we know several things. So we know that at the end of this story, he's now not just a servant of the Kandake, whatever that means. He's a servant of Jesus. He's someone who's not just an unknown. He's someone of real significance. And he may not have descendants of his own, but he had loads and loads of spiritual descendants. We know from history that the church in Ethiopia is one of the oldest surviving churches for 2,000 years they've been gathering and worshipping Jesus and that started with this man I don't know if you realize what's happened here but this is the first man in Africa to become a Christian this is such a significant moment in world history and the church which is now exploding across Africa has its ancient roots with this guy he's not an unknown he's got real significance and he's not without descendants. He's got hundreds of millions of spiritual descendants spreading around the world. He's been welcomed into something bigger because he's been welcomed into Jesus. See, the reality is in Jesus, there is purpose for the unimportant and there's family for the outsider. What about you and me? You and I can also be part of something significant and wonderful. See, Jesus knows you and he wants to love you. He wants to give you a real purpose and a real family. The Bible says that when Jesus died for sins, he was thinking of people like you and me. He loves you 
and has something wonderful and greater to offer you. Like this Ethiopian man whose life was turned upside down, you can find purpose and belonging. Jesus says, you belong with me. Look, I, as I finish, I want to say that I think this is my favourite thing about Christianity. The reality is that in Christianity, you get given a purpose and you get given belonging. This is the thing that brings me so much joy about the Christian faith. The Ethiopian eunuch has it. Philip has it. And thanks to God, you can have it too. Let me pray. Father God, thank you so much for this man. Thank you so much that we learn from his story that you can give a purpose and you can give belonging to all of us because of Jesus' death on the cross. Lord, I want to pray for all those who are hearing that for the first time. Help us to know it's true. And like the Ethiopian, go away with great joy. And thank you so much for Philip, who chats Jesus wherever he goes. We want to pray and ask that we would be like him, taking the opportunities wherever they come. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing but not Alive, all my failures I try to hide. It was my turn till I met you. When you called my name, I ran out of that grave. Out of darkness into your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness to your glorious day so glorious now your mercy my soul now your freedom is all that I know oh the old man knew Jesus when I met you you called my name I needed rescue, my sin was heavy The chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter, I was an orphan Now you've called me a citizen of heaven When I was broken, you were my healing Now your love is the air that I'm breathing I have a future, my eyes are open
Yeah, God, I just want to thank you so much for this day. And I thank you for the message that James is going to bring us today, Lord. Um, all about how persecution does not stop the gospel. And I just thank you so much for those first people, Lord, that carried your gospel and your love throughout the world and has created what we know today as Christianity, God. And um, yeah, I just thank you for their boldness and their courage. And I pray that we could just learn a little bit of that today. And I thank you so much for James and I thank you for the message that he's going to bring us. And I just pray that it would be completely... Um, all your words and that yeah he would just feel so much peace as he brings us this word God and um, yeah I just thank you that the gospel is for every single person on earth Lord that um, it's not for certain types of people God it is for every single person and so I just pray that we would just receive that um, and we receive the gift of salvation yeah I just thank you Jesus so much for everything that you're doing throughout this week and um, I just pray that you continue to work throughout these talks and through the worship, God. Um, and yeah, you would just come alongside these young people and they would just feel your love and feel so impacted by everything that they're hearing. Yeah, in your name. Amen. Father, thank you for H and DCYC, Lord. Thank you that we can still meet together despite everything that's going on in the world, Lord. And I pray for all the campers, Lord. I pray that you would help them in the up and coming school years, Lord. I know that things will be looking different from what we all imagine, Lord. And I pray that you would give all of our campers strength and peace about what is ahead of them, Lord. And I pray that you would use this time at camp profoundly in their lives, Lord. And I pray that they would grow in their relationship with you deeper and deeper Lord and I just thank you for who you are Lord and thank you for this opportunity to meet together Lord in Jesus name Amen that's it for day four see you guys tomorrow